Good evening ladies and gentlemen, this is Rusty78609 from Capitan, New Mexico on a beautiful day. Temperature right now is about 62 and it's going to be cool tonight. But what I wanted to talk with you, we're going to have kind of a fireside beer 30 chat. And what I'm going to talk about this time, I was sitting outside, you know, I'd been to the uh, rodeo grounds and I was, in my mind, I was seeing the ghost cowboys racing along and roping calves and riding bronx and all that and then it occurred to me that <clears throat> that i had some other ghosts i'd like I'd, I'd like to talk about one of them is andreas he was from mexico i don't think he was ever a u.s citizen he could have been and the other one is a dog named bill and they those two were my first friends that I can recall on this planet. Uh, I was probably three, four, five years old, six years old when some of this took place, and we'll get into the later years. But the first recollection I can have of Bill, my collie dog, was we lived at a, a place that was called the Tobe Place. It was owned by the Atkinson family, a wealthy banking family, and my dad was a sharecropper. And if you don't know what that means, it means somebody owns the land, you do the work, and you share uh, whatever that crop brings in. It's quarters, halves, whatever you can work out. And anyway, my dad was pretty successful at that, and eventually he got his own land, and that's another story. <clears throat> but uh, in, at that place, I had a collie dog. I can remember putting my arm out, and the dog was as tall as I was, so... Uh, I would say I must have been three or four years old. When I, that's my first recollection. I used to follow that. That dog would follow me everywhere. And uh, and that was my protection because I wandered off. My parents never told me to be anywhere, you know, be in or be out or do anything. I just came and went like a free spirit. And I pretty much do that now. You, you know, your early years are your formative years. But anyway, subsequent to that, uh, of course, I, I we moved a few years later to a, a place on a hill. My daddy had a few <clears throat> good crops, had a little money, bought his own land, and uh, we still leased land from other people. We had ended up, I think, a total about 1,200 acres, but we only owned, I don't know, I think the best we ever owned was around 400 acres, and then it, it, it sold some of it off, ended up with about 200 acres at the end. But anyway, uh, there was a man that worked for my grandfather, I was told, his name was Andreas. Now, Andreas was from Mexico. He spoke pretty good English uh, when he wanted to. and uh, But he became my friend in addition to my dog, Bill, who subsequently passed away. I don't know if he was run over or whatever, because we had a, a county road that ran close to our property called Burns Road, and, and people would burn up that road, you know what I mean? But it was a pretty good ways from the house, so you know the dog had to work at getting in front of a car, but things are what they are. But Andreas, now, <clears throat> so we'll take Bill out of the picture and move on to Andreas. Uh, of course, I was the youngest of four children. I had a brother and a sister older than me that were fraternal twins, not identical twins. Uh, a boy and a girl. My brother's name was, we always called him Butch. His real name was Davis. And then my older sister's name was Ginger. They called her Virginia. And then I, and they were six years older than I was. And then I had another sister about my, well, four years older than me named Jean. But anyway, enough said about that. But so when I was growing up at that place we moved to, uh, I was alone, you know, for because they'd be off at school for nine months a year. And so there I was. And the only real person around there was me. You know, my dad was working somewhere. My mother was probably doing stuff, whatever. So I would follow Andreas around like a little puppy dog. Now, he may have gotten tired of me, but I don't think so. And he was a genius managing animals. You know, we had a lot of Duroc hogs. We had a few head of cattle, not many. Had an old milk cow, Jersey. He milked her on a three-legged stool, believe it or not. And I watched him. I learned how to milk a cow watching Andreas. He showed me how. There's a trick to that, in case you, if you don't know. If you've never milked a cow, there's a trick to it. 
But anyway, enough said. So, but he could tell by looking at the uh, the old sows, the female pigs, when they were about ready to have a litter. And so you had to pin them up. Because whenever they had that litter, the old boars, the males, uh, would eat those young if they got to them. That's how cruel those old boar hogs can be, and they'll eat you too. But anyway, uh, of course, he would know, he could tell by looking at them. Of course, you know, it didn't take a mental giant, I guess, but no, he, he knew animals, and of course, we had chickens and stuff. And he lived, and this is really an interesting story to me, in that he lived in a Quonset hut, if you know what that is, old military hut with a uh, center fireplace, a cast iron fireplace, had a, a flue that went up through the center of the building and all the windows folded out, okay? But it was about, the plywood was about this thick. It was made out of plywood and uh, it didn't leak as far as I know. And he had a little cot about, I don't know, 26 inch, a military cot. And he had a, a military blanket, a pillow inside of there. And he had a little desk with a chair in there it was probably 10 by 10, I would say, 100 square feet. And uh, the door was always open. Of course, he could close it if he chose to. And he, we would go down in the field and gather stumps for him to use in his fireplace. He had an old Model There was a Model T pickup he drove. I don't know if it was his or whose. He never drove it into town. But he was a, a good guy, man. And uh, so we'd go down in the field, gather stumps, and he had his you know, heat in the winter from that fireplace. There was no power in that building, no running water, uh, no toilet, no nothing. It was just a building. Now, how he took care of all those things, I have no clue. But there was a, a windmill nearby that had a, we call it a cistern, and uh, it had a faucet and you know, there was a little garden hose there, so I guess that's where he took his baths and stuff. He did, I don't know how he did, he did. I never remember anybody saying he had an odor, uh, as far as I know, he always looked neat to me. And, uh, but anyway, he ate every meal inside our home at the same table the whole family ate at. The way it worked was this. Uh, after we ate our breakfast, you know, my mother would fix him a breakfast. And now, nobody in our family, including my mother and daddy, drank coffee ever. But Andreas liked coffee. So my mother would get coffee for him and fix it for him. And she might have snuck a cup every now and then for all I know. And maybe my dad did too, but nobody ever talked about it. But uh, no, it was just for him. She'd fix him a cup of coffee, and then whatever we had for breakfast, he had the same thing. If we had scrambled eggs, bacon, toast, or if we had, you know, waffles and all kind of whatever mother fixed. My mother was a great cook. Trust me on that. We lived good. We had a garden, everything, butchered our own hogs, butchered our own cattle. You know, we everything was fresh from the field or produce, whatever you want to call it. And so, yeah, he ate every meal. And the way that worked is uh, after we finished the meal and cleared the table, because they had two, you know, they, they, you know, they, they did it most of the inside, you know, like washing the dishes and stuff. My mother would tell me or my brother to go call Andreas for either breakfast, uh, uh, dinner, or supper. That's the way it was with us. You had breakfast, dinner, and supper. You know, there was no brunch or any of that stuff. You know, breakfast, a morning meal, meal dinner, noon, supper 6 p.m. And, th and that was every day of the week seven days a week we had all those sit down meals we had a tv but there was nothing on it everybody sat down at the table and uh you know it was it was pretty neat and so the, but again I, I would go to the back door of the house <clears throat> and i would say andreas your breakfast is ready or your dinner's ready or your supper's ready whatever and then here he'd come there was a trail that ran from our house to his quonset hut and it was probably about oh I'm going to say 75 yards or less to his front door. and But yeah, there was a nice path because he walked it three times a day, every day for several years. And uh, But anyway, uh, one morning, well, let's don't get to that yet. Uh, I remember uh, going with him down in the field, and I've, I've told bits of this story in other videos. So some of you are saying, well, we've heard that. You may have heard part of it. You ain't heard it all. But, you know, we went down in the field one day. I was, I, I'm going to say I was probably four years old in that range. But I was pretty good. I, mean, I was pretty good at finding stumps and throwing them in the back of the truck. But uh, he told me one day uh, we were down in the field, and he said he had to go take a shit. 
And uh, for all you people that that burns your ears, yo, I'll have a swallow of beer on that. So anyway, I didn't know what that meant. I thought he was going to get something for the truck or do something. So I watched him. Well, I found out what taking a shit meant real quick. And I thought, well, that's pretty neat. I got to remember that word, and I did. And uh, so we got back to the house, uh, you know, hauled his stumps, stacked them up in the back of his Quonset hut. And uh, and I went inside the house, and uh, I don't know, an hour or two later, I went into the kitchen and told my mother I had to take shit. Well, see, that doesn't work. It worked with Andreas, but it didn't work very well with me because back then, you know, we made our own soap and other things. And, uh, yeah, uh, you know, my mother, she washed my mouth out with soap like that was going to get the word out. But that's the way it was done back then, guys. I promise you, you never said shit again in front of your mama. It only took one lesson, guarantee you. And there were other lessons that you learned with only one lesson, and, there were, and that was it. You didn't have to read a book. It was like, that'll work every time. So, but anyway, one morning, and it was a fall morning, not too cold, but I went to the back door, and I called Andreas for breakfast. And uh, I waited, or I, I, my mother said, you know, something later, she said, you know, you sure you called? Out? Yeah, I did, I did. And she said, well, go check, maybe he didn't hear you. So anyway, I go out to the Quonset hut, doors open, and he's laying on his bed. It looks like he's sound asleep, you know. So I said, hey, Andreas, breakfast is ready or something. And uh, and he didn't move. And, uh, you know, I'd seen dead hogs, dead chickens, dead animals. So I knew what dead was, okay. And uh, so I went in. And he looked pretty peaceful to me. I, I said, Andreas, can you hear me? And, and nothing happened. And I moved him a little bit. And nothing happened. And, and he was dead. And so that was the first dead human I'd ever seen. And uh, it, re it really wasn't a shock. I was, uh, I didn't know. I, I, I just had a real weird feeling about the whole thing. I didn't know what happened when people died or, you know, nothing that I knew of. So I went back to the house, told my mother, and ended up, uh, got him buried. They had, a, they had a Mexican cemetery in Kennedy and then the Gringos. And then they had a World War II uh, German cemetery because there was a concentration, no, I call it a concentration camp. It was a, a prisoner of war camp in Kennedy, Texas, for uh, German uh, prisoners. And uh, I don't know what was going on there. It was a hell of a big area in Kennedy, Texas. Had several buildings. And, uh, you know, believe me, they dug graves and they'd bury them six or eight in a grave, you know. So it wasn't, uh, it was crazy, man. And, uh, but it was the biggest kept, it was the best kept secret in the whole world, okay? Because there were a few of those internment camps in areas of Texas. One of them was Kennedy, Texas. And I can remember going by the old buildings, but I was told by people that lived, that were much older during that era, you know, like they were in their 20s and 30s, you know, when that place was active, I was, I was only born in 1945, so... But be that as it may, uh, they told me that the German prisoners were actually allowed to go, you know, you know, in, into town and shop and all kind of stuff, and uh, and, and 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 they became friends with them. I mean, they, the Germans were good guys. They drink beer with all the uh, other people, and the ones that could speak pretty good English or learned English, uh, you know, it was it was a that that's one side of the story. But you know, there are there is a place next to the Kennedy. Uh, cemetery where they were buried. I mean, uh, now I'm not sure if they died from uh, wounds during the war or combat, and uh, but the, anyway, there were there was a cemetery next to to the regular cemetery and the Mexican cemetery, and uh, so that's the story on that. So, but be that as it may, the old ghosts of my youth uh, are still in here. You, know, you can't you can't get rid of memories. They're just there. And but I was thinking about old Andreas. You know what a guy, man. Uh, he used to laugh. I mean, uh, I don't think anybody ever knew him laughing. I did, because he used to go down. Uh, he'd get uh, on the weekends. My dad give him some money, and uh, he 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 didn't work seven days a week. He he was off on Saturdays and Sundays. You know, he, uh, you know other piddling stuff. My brother and I, of course, we were doing helping feed the animals too. You know, we were we, we did as much work as he did, uh, and so. <clears throat> but he was there all the time, and if we were in school, there were several things he did. But he used to go into town. And on the weekends and get drunk. 
he'd go to the friendly bar or other places in town and and uh, you know he kept a little uh, a little uh, pint of uh, uh, whiskey I, I, it may not have been whiskey I'm not sure what it was but he kept it in that he had a, a little desk with of one drawer and he also chewed brown mule chewing tobacco it comes in chunks they're about this thick and about that long and this way a little rectangle and you bite it off okay brown mule some of you may remember it I, I, I remember it for one reason I bit some off one time and I promise you you know they talk about your face turning green well mine turned uh, one shade further than that I mean talk about getting sick boy did I leave his tobacco alone from then on you bet don't mess with brown mule tobacco at the age of four, five, six, or seven. Well, whenever I found him dead, uh, actually, I, he, I was about, I'm going to say I was 10 or 11 when he passed away. So that's when I got into the brown mule, but it still made me sick. And another thing I did, my dad smoked cigars. Not often, but every now and then. He'd light up a cigar. And he had a, 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 a little secret spot in his drawer where he kept them, probably to keep me or Butch or my brother get, from getting them. But I'd sneak one. Well, you only sneak them one time. You know, that's as good as brown mule, I promise you. Uh, no, you smoke a cigar that's lo that's powerful, you know what I mean? And, you know, they came in little containers. You had to twist off the end. You know, they were, oh, they were muy bueno. And, uh, no, I, I smoked one. And, uh, man, I thought, man, how the hell can anybody do this? I'm dying. <laughs> it's killing me. I mean, talk about a nicotine overload. But, you know, that's kind of the growing up years, you know what I mean? And, and uh, you know, my formative years were, I was, well, of course, we worked hard on the farm. You know, we picked cotton, you know, hauled hay, stacked it in the barn, you know, chopped weeds, you know, did all kind of stuff. But we didn't even think about it as work because that's just the way things were done. And, of course, my mother was a great cook. We had three sit-down meals, seven days a week, 365 days a year. In fact, uh, mother and the, the girls used to go to church on Sunday. The dad and the boys, we didn't. Well, until later on, my father and my mother finally beat him into it. But we'd go check the, quote, crops, but we'd end up at Nona's Cafe in town drinking. My, my dad was, I don't know if he was drinking, I guess he was drinking coffee because he was sitting there at the table with the rest of the guys, so I guess he did. And then my brother and I played the pinball machine. You'd get a nickel and you could play a pinball machine, which was, that was kind of that, and I've talked about that before. But, uh, you know, but free as a bird, man, free as a bird. You know, there was no, uh, no, we, no one ever talked about politics. No one ever talked about religion. Uh, you know, my mother might have been a churcher, but, you know, she, she just was. You know, that's the way she was. She enjoyed it because she could go to town. She'd dress up and go into church, take the girls with her, all dressed up in starchy clothes. And uh, when I first was made to go, I had to wear a starch shirt and all that crap. I thought, oh, man, wait, like, I can't wait to get out of this church. But enough said about that. Uh, you know, uh, it, it was life, you know, and, and uh, it was a small town, much like it is right here where I am right now. So what else can I add to all this? All I can tell you is, guys, uh, you know, for those of you that are just starting out here in the world now and it's kind of like this, it's just the way it is. Just adapt, move on, everything. Life is good, okay? Life is good. It's as good as you make it. So if you're not happy or you're uh, whatever, it's up to you, you know? I mean, uh, I was loaded with... Uh, good baggage, so to speak, because in my whole growing up life at home, my parents never told me when to be home, where to be, and whatever. I just knew what I had to do, and I did it. As far as going out to dances and stuff and coming in at 2 or 3 a.m., I didn't do it. Why? I thought it was stupid to stay up that late. I enjoyed sleeping, you know? And would I go out and get drunk with the guys and, and go to dances and all that stuff? Sure. But, uh, you know, I just, I don't know, man. I, I was a different person from most of the group, and I knew it. And so I just kind of went along sometimes, and that was life. But, but old Andreas, here's to you, Andreas, wherever you are. And I think his last name was Rodriguez. I could be wrong on that because I don't know that I ever knew his last name. It was Andreas. You know, he wore the old uh, bloused uh, khaki pants, and he always wore a khaki long sleeve shirt, and he had a uh, 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 hat 
a straw hat, and that was his uniform. That that that, and that was every day. You know, mother washed his clothes, and uh, you know he uh, he he was just uh, he was there. You know what I mean? He was the presence. I mean, he was. You know, he was just there. I mean, I always I expect him to be there forever, you know. And I'm sure everyone does that with friends and relatives and stuff. You know, they're just there and they're never going to leave. But he did. Uh, he sure did. And so did my old dog, Bill. But, you know, life goes on just as it will now. And I think the purpose of this video is to let you know that. You know, this is just one tweak in the whole universe. This is nothing. So enjoy your life and uh, hold on. Skull. Prost. Cheers. <clears throat>